told you about that was before we thought, okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, can I ask you to sign your life away to tell me you are here? Good for my records. Do you want me to start that off again? Um, just switch this on. I don't know if you've all noticed that the Blackboard site now for this module. Um, I'll just show you what is there. Um, on the Blackboard site for this module now, if you go into the module information area, you should see the module descriptor. Have a look through that. Module the learning materials is the more interesting area though. The key textbook for the module, which I've showed you, is there. All right. This is also the key textbook for the dissertation module. So if you're thinking about getting access to that and using it, you will find it useful for that because we are preparing for the, the dissertation, but it's entirely up to you whether you feel you want to invest in that or not. There's some directed learning material here which takes you through the different stages of getting ready for the dissertation linked to that key textbook. Um, for instance, in the research proposal, which I've suggested on the research proposal form that you have a look at, I'm suggesting you look at chapter 11 and there's a series of, I'm asking you to read various things and then to look at it at a chapter question, something for you to reflect upon after reading through the chapter. So you've got that information there if you want to take advantage of it. The link to cite them right, yes, which is if you scroll down, it is on the column at the top on the left. You need to enter your username and your password if you want to access that. I'm sure you're all avid users of cite them right. The University Ethics and Governance web page, which you have to declare on the research proposal form that you have read, particularly the Ethics and Governance Handbook. And we'll just talk about that today. If you remember, I said I was going to look at this this week, all the ethical issues to do with your research. But that's the link to it. Um, the APM Body of Knowledge, you need to click there and it will open up a PDF file, or it should do. There you go. As part of filling in your research proposal, you need to be explaining what aspect of APM and body of knowledge your research fits. You're anchoring this into a project management theme. The dissertation exemplars, don't know how well this works. Oh, there you go. If you click on here, it'll take you to historical dissertations that have been handed in. Um, Okay, the, the, the dissertations I suggest you have a look at, the top three, Manuela, Tursus and Jonathan's, they were the three students who were nominated for the APM award, the Jeffrey Trimble award for the master's dissertation, Tursus won. Other dissertations that I am very comfortable you thinking about having a look at is Theresio Hansen. Um, that was a very good piece of work which was identified by the external examiners they, they commented very favourably on her work um, just going down the list Jerome Mertz he was the last person to be nominated as a finalist for the APM Jeffrey Trimble Masters Dissertation Award sadly he didn't win we were devastated for him and for us of course so that's a very good one to look at. Still going down the list. Are there any more? No, they're the, probably the key ones I would suggest you have a look at. Every dissertation that is there has passed the module. So you've got from a basic 50 right up to wherever. I can't tell you individual marks but I'm quite comfortable telling you which are the very, very good ones. And I'm sure those students would be quite happy me saying these are the very, very good ones. Um, so have a look at those if you have some time. Uh, <clears throat> still in the learning materials area, um, the lecture slides um, are there. This week's lecture notes are there already, what we're going to cover today. 
<coughs> in the module assessment area, <coughs> you have the research proposal form. Now, this is quite tricky. This causes a little bit of uncertainty for some people each year. The actual research proposal form you access by clicking the attached file. Right, so you need to click that, download the file, and complete it on a PC which is not connected to the university network. The way the university network has set up Adobe, it won't allow you to fill the form in. You will have to do this on a PC, not part of the university network, and it will work fine. Then, when you fill the form in, you submit it by clicking on the top research proposal link, and that will take you to the process for submitting. All right, it's quite confusing in that respect. So the file is there, and the submission facility is there. All right. Um, I've tried to explain it in the first paragraph, and it's the same situation with the research project ethics registration form click that to access the file. You will need to download and print it. Well, you need to print it out this time. Complete it by hand. I need your signature. Then scan it. Then upload it. Yes? And you put the original in your research evidence file. And we'll talk about that in the future. So you need to keep the original to put in your evidence file, but a scanned electronic copy with your signature needs to be uploaded and submitted there. Anybody got any questions about what we have on the ALP? I think you've got access to everything that you need so far. Yeah? Right, today. Um, today, if you remember last week, we started thinking about issues to do with research ethics. And research ethics are a very, very important part of the research process. They are something you can't ignore, you have to follow them. It's a strict requirement. Now this isn't me, as the module tutor for the dissertation, laying down what you have to do, because I may, may be control freak, which I'm not. It's me asking you on behalf of the faculty, which is being told by the university, how you need to undertake research from an ethical standpoint. So I'm relaying that message to you. There are no bypasses to the procedures that you have to follow, I'm afraid. You've got to be very careful and make sure that you follow these in the manner that I'm asking you to do. I don't want anybody to worry about this because what the faculty has put in place in terms of procedures are quite old, are quite. Um, I want to say onus, and that's not the right word. They are very simple to follow. It's not a difficult task to do. It's just demonstrating good practice with a little bit of thought, and you will be fine. So you shouldn't get um, concerned about this. Just follow the guidelines that I'm going to go through with you as part of your research process, and you will be fine. So. Um, what we're going to cover today is we're going to think about what ethics are. And we covered a little bit about ethics in 1173, so all of you have had this, but we're going to focus it from a research project point of view today. Um, how do we link ethics to research? What is the function of ethical codes and ethical committees? And extreme situations um, of ethical issues I will have to refer your proposal to the Faculty um, Ethics Committee, and I'll explain to you what will happen in those circumstances. Um, what are the consequences of ethical digressions in research and for your master's degree? And how do you ensure your research is ethical, which is the whole point of this exercise, really, to tell you what it is you need to do to make sure you are fine? And how do we go through the ethical approval procedure for the dissertation? So that's what we're going to cover as part of today's session. Um, now, eth moral behaviour, description of ethics. Now, May has said that ethics is concerned with the attempts to formulate codes and principles of moral behaviour. So there's a link here to morals in terms of what is the right thing to do, what is not the right thing to do. 
but a distinction is made sometimes between ethics and morals. Um, while both are concerned with what is good, bad, or right or wrong, ethics is usually taken as referring to general principles of what of one ought to do, so what you should be doing, while morals are usually taken as concerned with whatever, whether or not a specific act is consistent with accepting notions of right or wrong. So there's a difference between moral behaviour and ethical behaviour, and that's what we need to understand, particularly from a research point of view. Now Hart, in the key textbook for the dissertation, has said that it is because research is context-based. Now if you think, when we've been talking about the research proposal, I've said to you all, you've got to think about a context for your study. The criterion for limiting that for students on construction project management is the industrial context needs to be the construction industry. But for those of you studying project management, the MSc project management masters, you can choose any industrial context, ironically construction as well. So research is context based and one cannot foresee what ethical dilemmas will arise. That ethics in research in any generic sense is difficult to define. So. There is a difficulty because there was going to be quite a range of research contexts with you guys working on your dissertation. Some of you may be choosing, I don't know, engineering, some may be choosing um, information technology, software development, some of you may be choosing more about telecommunications, I'm just spouting off the top of my head recent topics, marketing issues, health, um, sports science, project management, sports science, we've, you name it, we've had a range of topics. And what Hart here is saying is that you can't have necessarily a generic ethical statement for globally for the different research contexts. You are going to have to give this some careful consideration when you are setting up and formulating your research project. <coughs> Stakeholders need to be thought of very carefully when you're setting up your research project, particularly in terms of the research ethics. There are four key stakeholders, the dissertation, the research project itself, that is a stakeholder, believe it or not, it's an entity, and you, as a researcher, as a key stakeholder, the sponsor uh, or the university. Now you have to understand that the university is not sponsoring you to do this master's dissertation. Okay? But the university is a stakeholder. And the people who take part, the participants in your study. So they're the four broad areas of your research um, in terms of ethical dilemmas, things that you need to be taking into consideration. So some of the decisions that you're going to have to make in terms of the ethical dilemmas for these stakeholders can be broken down into two areas. One is called expediency and the other one is principles. Expediency is, and what we mean by this is, what is needed for the research to continue as planned. So what is it you need to do to ensure ethical protocols are met to make sure that your Plan, your project, your research will be conducted in the way that you hope it will be. Principles are what you consider as right or wrong. So how do we distinguish what is good practice in terms of context-based ethical practice or not? So these are things you're going to have to make decisions upon when you're thinking about the ethical protocols you're going to have to follow for your research. <coughs> now, responsibility for ethics. Hart, again in the key textbook, said that because research has many stakeholders with different standpoints, so think about the university's view of your research and the ethics of your research, how does that differ to your view as the, the, the researcher? There will be a slight difference, a slight different view on this. 
So because research has many stakeholders with different standpoints, sometimes conflicting ethical positions need to be dealt with. That is actually happening as we speak with a student who is hoping or hopes to start his dissertation in January. There is a differing view in terms of ethics and well-being which has not yet been resolved and is going through the Faculty uh, Ethics Committee. Once it gets to that point, I'm sort of de slightly detached from this process. Although I keep an eye on what is going on, it's the Faculty Ethics Committee who will be informing you of what you need to do to make sure that ethics are adhered to. So there is, in this example, a slightly different um, standpoint in terms of what is, if, what is, particularly from a safety point of view, what is safe and what is not safe between the researcher, the master student, and the faculty executive ethics committee. And that's still being discussed and resolved as we speak. So whatever the issue, it is the researcher's responsibility to deal with ethical considerations to ensure well-being. And this is something which this particular researcher has not grasped. It's been communicated quite clear to him that there is a well-being issue, particularly their well-being issue, and we're looking for um, protocols in his proposed practice to ensure that they will make sure that there is no well-being problems for themselves or anybody else who takes part in the study. So you have a responsibility as future researchers on this research project to be thinking about well-being. Your own and everybody who takes part in your project. You cannot ignore that. So, um, the American Psychological Association have given a list of ethical principles for psychologists in terms of a code of conduct. And these are quite interesting actually. And the hyperlink to that code is on the bottom of the page there. But we need to maybe think about these when you're setting up your research project for your dissertation. Competence is the first area. Provide only those services and use only those techniques for which you are qualified. We talked about this last week, didn't we? Integrity. Be honest, fair and respectful of others. Do not make statements which are false, misleading or deceptive. Professional and scientific responsibility. Uphold standards of conduct, obligations, accept responsibility for behaviour. Respect people's rights and dignity. Respect the fundamental rights, dignity and worth of all people. Privacy, confidentiality, and we'll come to that as a separate thing. And self-determination. Others' welfare. Respect the welfare of those with, that should be with whom instead of with whom, with whom you interact. And social responsibility. Be aware of your professional and scientific responsibility. Apply and make public your knowledge to contribute to human welfare. So, the ethical procedures that we're going to look at in terms of the forms and the various bits and pieces that you need to do generally resolve around welfare and confidentiality. But these other areas are something you've got to be thinking about when you are formulating your research project. You think about this in a very simple way. You are going to speak to people, companies, whoever they may be, and ask them to give you data to help you with your dissertation. They will want to know that you can be trusted with that data, that it will be um, safe in your hands, that it will be, there will be no harm to them or anybody else by them passing that information on to you. And you need to make certain commitments to the people who are taking part in your study that you will respect the value of their data. It's very important. I'll give you a personal example of something I experienced recently, very much around that point a little bit later. Um, now, the National Committee for Ethics and Social Science Research and Health in India has um, listed some more aspirational ethical research codes. They've listed four. Null malfeasance. Well, that's a difficult one to say, if I pronounce it rightly. Research must not cause harm to the participants in particular and to the people in general. 
That's a really important thing. No harm. Now, we're not just talking about physical harm. There is all other types of harm, psychological, social, credibility, financial, whatever, sensitivity. No harm must come to anybody taking part in your study. Um, beneficence, research should make a positive contribution to the welfare of people. Now, bear in mind this is a social science thing, and maybe you're thinking, well, my research isn't going to look at the welfare of people. But let's phrase that slightly different. Research should make a positive contribution towards people working in whatever context you're talking about. Marketing, finance, software development, whatever. Autonomy, research must respect the rights and dignity of participants. Justice, the benefits and risks of research should be fairly distributed among people. Now that's interesting. So you shouldn't be producing this research for your own benefit. The whole purpose of the, the project should be to further expand knowledge, understanding. Sometimes the people who you speak to, the companies, it's often courteous to say, I will share with you the outcomes of the study. They would be very happy. That's often, you could use it almost as a sweetener, if you like, to sort of maybe help them agree to take part in your study. But I think it's common courteous this, that you say, well, once I've completed this study, as part of your agreement to take part, I'm sure you're interested to find out what we discover. I will share that with you. So I think you need to be thinking about that as well. So people can see how they've contributed to your understanding of the issue. Now, in terms of misconduct, you know, that's an awful phrase here, and I'm sure nobody is going to misconduct themselves from an ethical standard point of view, but what are the issues from an institutional and a personal and career point of view? Now, this is a list from Hart. From an institutional point of view, there's all sorts of um, problems can occur. Obviously, none of you are employed as an employee for Northumbria, um, but there are a list of issues there, should you hear from in terms of industrial ac uh, institutional actions. Maybe the one which you could be thinking a little bit about in terms of dismissal from the school. Uh, I'm sure that's a bit excessive, but this is what Hart is saying. Um, I often wonder whether he's writing this from the point of view of you being a researcher employed by the institution. So if you are not following ethical protocol, then obviously you could be dismissed in that, from that perspective. But I'm not so sure you could be dismissed from the school as a master student. But I'd have to check the student regulations. <laughs> but anyway, let's have a look at the personal and career section, which I think is a bit more um, appropriate to your circumstances. Um, the top one again doesn't fit. Loss of respect and recognition by peers. Obviously, there will be a bit of um, possible legal proceedings. That is something you need to be very wary of. It is something which is, you know, could happen to you if you don't follow ethical practice. Um, it could be an end of academic career prospects. For instance, if you've got aspirations of working on a PhD next or in the future. You don't know, maybe you don't, maybe it's something which could happen in the future. You think, hmm. And if there's been an ethical problem with this, if we are asked to write a reference, we are obliged to pass that information on. So be careful. Um, retraction and correction. Do you have to go back to people and say, I'm really sorry I've done this, I shouldn't have done it, how embarrassing is that? How difficult will that be? So have a think about those issues. As we say, some of them aren't totally relevant to you guys, but there's still the feeling there of this is something that should not just be glossed over. Now, in terms of your research, there's sort of four areas you need to be thinking about. Um, applying the standards, how you go about designing and constructing your research in the process, how you're going to report the research and also the process of implementing the research itself. So we sort of go through 
um, the process from there around really. So let's have a look at what you need to be thinking about in terms of applying the standards. That's a really bad colour. Um, so to think about your personal code of ethics. We all have one. So how are you going to follow your own ethical codes of practice? Are you aware of maybe what the formal codes of practice are, which we're going to cover today, and I've directed you to read the university's um, governance and ethics handbook, which you need to be aware of. So they're the formal codes that you need to be applying to. Um, thinking about scholarship aspirations and your peers. What is the expectations of peers in terms of you applying ethical standards in your research project? There is an expectation. Your supervisor will be keeping an eye on you as well in terms of you applying ethical practice as part of the supervision process. It's part of the expectations of good scholarship. You are going to have to report that in your research project, in your dissertation. You will need to give an explanation about research ethics, how you've addressed it in your study. Designing the research... Oops, gone the wrong way. Oh, no, it's the right one. Um, designing the research, you need to be thinking about ethics when you are defining your research topic. So I've asked you to start thinking about your research proposal now. So you need to be thinking about these issues as part of that process. Um, thinking about your methodology, how will ethics affect you in that point of view? And we'll be looking at some methodological issues a little bit later. The use of literature, how are you going to use literature within your research? Are you going to reference it properly? Are you going to put paraphrases in there without referencing it? That is ethical malpractice. Um, sponsorship. Um, if you are being sponsored, which I don't know that any of you are, to do your master's dissertation, you may be being sponsored for your master's degree, but there may be issues there, I don't know. Maybe a sponsor is saying, I would like you to look at this for your dissertation. I don't know. Um, the methods that you select, how will they influence, or how should they be influenced, and also maybe delivered and implemented by ethical practice, we're going to look at that. How you select your sample, um, the vulnerability of the subjects and the sensitivity of the topic. If the topic's very sensitive, then you need to be thinking about how vulnerable are the people who you are hoping to speak to. And we discussed last week about what do we mean by vulnerable adults, I think. And I said, well, if you have a look at the ethical code of practice, it explains in there. So these are things which will affect how you design your research project if you are planning to speak to vulnerable subjects. Um, actually implementing the research, um, data sources, you need to be thinking about that now. Where are you going to go to get your data? I wish I had in that cupboard packets of data that I could just give you all and say, here you are. What, what is it you're doing? Software development. Um, there you go. We don't have that. So you've got to think about data sources, where you're going to go for your data. You need to be contacting people, companies now as you're starting to get your ideas together. Would you be interested in taking part in my study? How are you choosing those data sources? You need to be thinking ethically about that. How you are going to collect, extract the data, think about ethics in those procedures. Human rights, going back to thinking about harm. No harm should come to anybody. You or the participants in the study, or any of the other stakeholders, you shouldn't be coercing, forcing people to take part in your study. Nobody should be representing you in doing this on your behalf. People should willingly be taking part in your study. Um, there should be no worry of harm to them. No deception involved. Are you going to secretly audio record interviews? Or are you going to secretly video record interviews without people knowing? Are you going to sit secretly in project, sit in project meetings? 
observing, but recording, video recording, whatever, whatever, without people realizing. That's a form of misconduct. How honest are you going to be with the purpose of the study? I'm actually doing a study on this, but in reality you're doing a study on that. That's being deceptive, it's not good ethical practice. People need to know exactly what you are doing, what is the purpose of the study. Are you making that very clear? Um, distance, I think, means in terms of how close you are to the people taking part as in a social, psychological, whatever point of view. How you, know, you can't get too close to the study. If you do, then you may bias or influence it in a way. If you are part of the study context, there was a student a few years ago now, master student, who did a participation, participatory type methodology where he was part of the project team himself. So he was involved in the study couldn't do it any other way. Um, you have to look at various methodologies for that and the ethics associated with that. So that was interesting. So distance, how close you are to the people taking part in the study should be taken into consideration. Um, reporting. Um, we'll not go through everything. Key ones here that I want you to think about. Is falsification, fraud and deception. <laughs> Plagiarism both of the data and the writing up. Um, there's issues to do with authorship which links to plagiarism in terms of are you correctly citing other people's views, other people's opinions. Self-citation, this is a question that we get asked a lot about. Can I regurgitate material that I've handed in for the assignments and put it in my dissertation? The answer is no, you can't do that, believe it or not. You can't take paragraphs and chapters from one assignment and put it in your dissertation. It's not allowed if you look at the assessment regulations. Um, storage of data is a crucial one. Well, well, in terms of the data, the integrity of the data, how you collect it, how you interpret the data. Are you interpreting it in a neutral, objective way? How you're presenting the data? Storage and access. You shouldn't be storing data on a USB key memory stick. If you lose that, then immediately there's issues to do with the Data Protection Act. You haven't taken care of that data. It's people giving you whatever it is, whether you've got MP3 or MP4 files on there, or transcripts, whatever. So you need to think carefully about how you store the data make sure it maintain confidentiality within that too. So ethics in research is quite a big area. It's not something you can just ignore. You've got to be thinking about this in every aspect of your study, from inception through to completion and beyond. And we'll talk about the beyond a bit as well. So <coughs> You have to conduct empirical research for your master's degree. Okay, so somehow you've got to uh, handle data and interpret the data. It could be primary data new to you. It could be secondary data, data which has been published by various bodies, statistics. Um, if you're going into a company, if they're giving you permission and you're going through their um, end of year project appraisals or whatever, and you're extracting data, that's not primary data, that's secondary data. They have acquired that data, you were taking their secondary data, their data and using it. But if you're using secondary data, you need to interpret it in a new way to you. You're not presenting somebody else's interpretation of that data. But you need to handle and interpret data for your master's degree. Can be both, by the way. Sorry, I meant to mention that earlier. You can have primary and secondary data. You can use both when you research. So there's no problem with that. Um, and as we've <coughs> talked about, you need to be thinking about the ethical issues in relation to this whole process in your research. Now, the university has the Research Ethics and Governance Handbook, and that sets down the principles of ethical practice and behavior that you have to follow for your master's
dissertation. And when you submit your research proposal form, there's a box on there which you have to say, I have read this. If you say, I have read it, and you haven't read it, and there is a legal issue which arises because of your ethical misconduct, you won't really have much to stand on if you declared you've read the handbook when you aren't following good practice. The link to this I've shown you is on the, um, the website, uh, so the Elin Important site. It is just here. There it is there, the Research Ethics and Governments Handbook. You need to read through that to understand what it is saying. So have a look at that. Oops. Um, so key things in terms of what the university is saying, just to sort of highlight for you. Will the research involve human subjects or participants, for example, in surveys or interviews or experiments? Most people use human participants as part of their master's dissertation, most people. And in particular, whether the research would involve vulnerable subjects for example, children, other young people under the age of 18, the elderly, asylum seekers, those with ill health or some form of disability. All right. it is, I've yet to experience a master's student on this program who is hoping to work with vulnerable subjects. Um, I've had students who work in an environment where they are vulnerable people, but they haven't spoken to the vulnerable people themselves. They've spoken to the managers of various projects and initiatives to support vulnerable people. So you're then not getting into that level of complexity from an ethical standpoint. Will the research involve the collection of data that will not be permitted to be used for other projects or which involves the collection of data of a potentially confidential nature or otherwise is personally, commercially, or politically sensitive information. No matter what you were to do, if you were to ask me to take part in a study, I would always make the decision that it is personally sensitive, because I am giving you my opinions on something. So this is the way you've got to look at this. If you're interviewing a project manager, asking them their views on how they handle risk in projects, to me, that still is a personally sensitive issue. It could also have commercial sensitivities. How does the risk management practice, how is that informed by policies within that company? So there's a commercial aspect to this as well. Does the commercial as does, does the company not want this made publicly because of political issues? Do they want this brought out in the public? What could politically be the consequences of this information being made available? Just by you interviewing a project manager, and you thinking this is quite straightforward, it isn't. And this is what you need to understand. You're being entrusted with very sensitive information, which on surface level may not feel sensitive or politically or commercially delicate. So you've got to take that into consideration. It's something you've got to think about. Um, now the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK has given some more guidelines on this. Research should be designed, reviewed and undertaken in a way that ensures its integrity and quality. Researchers and research subjects participants must be fully informed about the, pro the purpose, methods, and intended possible uses of the research, what their participation in the research entails, and what risk, if any, are involved. Now, this is all addressed by a form which you have to use as the research participant can consent form. I will show you that. But you have to make sure that you fully inform everybody who's going to take part in this study, and get their permission for them to take part. The problems with that are, what if you're doing a survey administered by an online questionnaire? 
how do you get people to agree to that? What about a telephone interview? How do you get their agreement to take part with a telephone interview? Because you can't necessarily say, here is a form, please fill it in, if they are halfway around the world. So we need to think about practical approaches to how we get informed consent using these more speedier approaches to data collection. There are some guidelines which I'll go through with you. Um, the confidentiality of the information supplied by research subjects and really anonymity of respondents must be respected. So you need to make sure that you adhere to the fact that they do not want their name mentioned. Mr. Smith of Brown Associates. Okay. This is a question that is often asked regularly by students who get the support of blue chip companies. You know the like, let's just go off the top of our head. Who would we call a blue chip company? Um, I don't know, say Google, Microsoft, um, Amazon, um, manufacturing, let's think. Ford cars, whatever, big name companies. Sometimes companies get into these, sorry, students get into these companies to conduct research. The company will say, yes, we're happy for you to take part. And I always advise students, do not put that company name in your research at all. There's no need for it. Do you really need to say this research was undertaken at Nokia? No. You don't need to say that at all. If you say this research was undertaken in a large telecommunications company, blah, 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 blah. We don't need to know it's not here. It makes no difference. You get no extra marks for saying the name of the company at all. So think carefully about that. My recommendation is that you keep confidentiality at the forefront of your mind. There's no need to be declaring or stating the names of companies or individuals at all in your research. Even if they say, I am happy for you to do this, no need whatsoever. Um, think about harm to the research participants. It, it must be avoided, and that includes you. Well, there must be no harm to you as, as a result of this study, or potential harm. Um, and the independence and impartiality of researchers must be clear, and any conflicts of interest or partiality must be explicit. This all goes down to how close you are to the subject, the data. Are you doing a research on a family firm? Are you doing research using friends in an old company? How close are you to the data? Are you going to bias the interpretation? So you need to be thinking about impartiality and independence. Now, the first step in all of this is the Research Project Ethics Registration Form long title, um, but that needs to be filled in and submitted when you submit your research proposal form. Um, if you change the focus of your research topic after you've submitted your research pro um, proposal form and after you've had, yes this is fine, off you go, you will need to submit a new research proposal form and a new research project ethics registration form. And what does it look like? This is what it looks like. You have a copy to access this on the e-learning portal. Um, it's just a straightforward form really. Your names, in terms of your family and your given names, your university ID, the program that you're studying, supervision venue, what's going here, or somewhere. When you're anticipating starting the project, which will be June, the type of your research project, um, a short description of your research project and your methodology. Now remember, you're handing this in with your research proposal form, which goes into this in a bit more detail, but you still need to give a summary for this form. Um, and then a series of questions. You need to double strike through your unwanted response. So when you cross, you cross out what isn't correct for your situation. So, ethical considerations in the research project. Does your research involve human participants? Yes or no? So if the answer is yes, you strike out the no. 
Believe it or not, people have been getting that confused. Then, if you're answering yes to that, you need to go through these eight questions, these seven questions, sorry. Will you inform participants about the research? Yes or no. Will you obtain their consent using the standard participant consent form? Yes or no. Is any deception involved? Yes or no. Do any participants constitute a vulnerable group? Yes or no. Will the research involve commercially, personally, personally, politically sensitive information? Yes or no. Are there likely to be any risks for you or for the participants in your research? Yes or no. And lastly, if you're answering question three, four, five, six, or seven, have you identified steps to address the issues? Yes or no. Very simple. Then you need to write a statement explaining how you are going to address any of the issues that have been highlighted above there in this box. Continue there, and then you sign the form there. I have read, again, I have read the university and the faculty ethics policy procedures and confirmed that the answers I have given the book are correct. But if further, if further issues arise under question three, four, five, six, or seven, I have described in writing how I intend to put these issues in the research. Must have this. Cannot start dissertation module without this. So it's, you've got to hand this in with your research proposal form. All right. Fair. Anybody got any questions about that? It's fairly straightforward, really. No. Good. Um, now, you hand this form in with your research proposal. What happens next? Well, um, it will be classified um, in terms of a risk category. Red, amber, or green. Um, I have yet to see any student be classified as green, which is that is, other projects, Green should not raise any ethical issues and may be approved by a designated member of staff. So there's no risks for you doing a research project whatsoever. Have yet to see that. The bulk of people will have amber, which is classed as a medium risk. Research involves human participants, personal data, commercially sensitive information, or environmental issues. All other projects must be approved by the Research Ethics Committee. The Research Ethics approval is delegated to a designated member of staff, which will either be me or your supervisor, who will usually give approval subject to conditions that the university ethics procedures are adhered to. For example, you will need to use consent forms for the participants, how you're going to store your information, how you're going to make sure confidentiality is addressed, so on and so forth. And red, um, we've had a couple of those this year. Um, normally around vulnerable participants um, isn't the case in the past for the, the most recent ones. The most recent ones were this. Safety concern for the researchers or participants would include physical risks, emotional distress, and professional harm. All red research projects must be approved by the Research Ethics Committee. This will be obtained at a meeting by the Research Ethics Committee or by Chair's Action, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so if there's any suspicion of harm to you or to anybody else, or if you're saying you're going to involve uh, vulnerable people, then you will get a red classification. If it goes to the Research Ethics Committee, they will look at your document, they may want some additional information from you, and they will generally give you some guidelines in terms of what they want you to do to make sure that this is going to be ethically sound and safe. Okay, some reassurance. <coughs> the approval form, you'll get this um, after you hand in your research proposal form and your research ethics approval form. <coughs> So it has your information on the top, and it will say it's either red, amber, or green. Then if it is approved without conditions, but if it's approved with conditions, which is amber, and virtually every master student will have the amber, unless there's exceptions for red, you will have these conditions. 
Information is provided to the participants using the research participant consent form. Participant consent, sorry, information is given to them about what it is you're doing. The participant consent form will be used. Data is stored securely in accordance with the university guidelines and maybe another issue as well. Um, and that depends on the context. Because if you remember right at the beginning, Hart said that research ethics has to be supported by giving consideration to the context of your study. So maybe there's a contextual issue we need to be thinking about. <coughs> um, we're near the end now. Well done for holding on. Um, participant consent forms. These are important. So, where information is to be gathered from per persons participating in research through interviews, questionnaires, or by observing, then you need to ask people to complete a participant consent form. Or use one of the methods, which I will show you in a moment, if you're doing a telephone interview or using an online survey. A research participant consent form must be completed by each participant. So you don't have a representative of the company signing it on behalf of the people working for their company who are to take part in this study. It must be by each individual who you speak to or observe or ask to do some form of data extraction process. The form considers issues of anonymity and confidentiality. All right, you need to get this approval from them. And you need to put these forms in a file called your research evidence file. Again, this is a university requirement. I'll talk to you more about what the research evidence file is and the things you need to put into it later. You have to hand your research evidence file in at the time of submission. The university will not accept your dissertation for assessment unless you hand in your evidence file at that point. It's got to be at the same time. <coughs> um, if you were going to conduct an interview by telephone rather than a face-to-face -face interview, how do you get participant consent? Well, okay, these are things that you can do. Firstly, Set up the telephone interview and send the research participant consent form in advance by post. Telephone interviews are only to be carried out once the forms are received and signed by the participant. That's one approach, maybe not the easiest. Second one, students can set up the telephone interview in advance by email with the research participant consent form attached. The consent form should be returned and printed out telephone interviews must only be carried out once the completed forms are received back from the participants. A slightly less onerous version, but you're still expecting them to print it out, sign it, post it back to you. So it's still quite a complicated, lengthy process. Taping option. The student should telephone the proposed participant and ask for their permission to record and obtain consent verbally. Once the recorder is on, the student and the interviewee should go through the issues raised in the participant consent form and record their answers. This will then create either an audio tape or a digital sound file. Either will need to be submitted like a written form within the evidence file. So you could do that way. Or a report of the telephone interview should be sent to the participant for approval with an accompanying letter, which should provide the following statement. You could do this by email, I guess. If no response to this request for consent to use the transcribed information from the telephone interview is received within one month of the date of this letter or email, consent is deemed to have been provided. So you've got four options there in terms of how you get consent from people by a telephone type scenario. This obviously is the easiest version. Yes, I have a question. Um, last year I got from one of my participants um, a, a digital signature yes. in an email. Is that also 
that how they, they wanted to say they were happy to take yeah. part? Because they couldn't print it out at that time. And the, the other participants, they printed out the form and they signed it and they scanned it for me and sent it back, which was really nice. But that one participant couldn't Could do, do it. Because I did my interviews over Skype. Yes. I would suggest in that situation that you send the consent form off to the participant electronically and you ask them to write in an email they have read the consent form and that they clearly agree to all of the conditions in their email and send that back. I think we've sort of slightly moved on since these guidelines have been published a little bit in that respect. But um, as long as you've got an email from that individual saying, I read the form, I'm in receipt of the form, I have read it, I am happy with all of the questions, all of the issues, I agree to take part, that would be fine by the form. Is that okay? I don't think this is too onerous. That, to me, is a little bit more thinking ahead, and you're at the, the mercy of the, the postal system, really. Um, Again, that's a slightly quicker version of this. This one is quite good, because you, you, you can ask them verbally during the interview to get their agreement, so there's nothing wrong with that. This one is, you do the interview, you give them a transcription, and you send it back with that, or the scenario which Anouk's just told that you could get their consent by email beforehand whichever way possible, saying that they've, they've had access to the consent for the need, they're quite happy to take part. Yeah? So it's not that onerous, actually. So that's a telephone-type interview. If you can't physically say, please fill this form in as part of a you know, physical face-to-face -face interview. Um, now, if you were going to send a questionnaire, instead of maybe speaking to people by telephone interview. So say you want to send, I don't know, you can you can do various things with Google Documents these days. You can set up surveys with that, and I've used it myself. I don't know whether you've filled one in before for 1171. I asked you to fill in a proper review of the module that was through Google Docs. Um, or you can use um, just a bog standard Word template if you want to do, if you feel that's just a step too far for you. Or you can use things like SurveyMonkey. I don't know if you're familiar with that. There are a host of others online where you can um, set up a questionnaire which is administered online. If you're going to use any of those approaches, then you need to include the following statement on your questionnaire. I understand the purpose of this research and agree to participate. The return of the questionnaire with this statement implies that the respondent has given consent. So if they submit their survey electronically through SurveyMonkey or whatever, provided on the survey you have that statement, as soon as they click submit, they are giving you implied consent that they are happy for you to use their data. Okay. So you need to include that on there. So that's how you handle getting participant consent from telephone interviews or distance type surveys fairly straightforward. But for face-to-face -face interaction, then you would use the research process of in consent form, which is this thing here. Um, on the top, your name, the organ sorry, the name of the applicant, um, Mr. Smith of Brown Associates, type of your research project, your name, MSC project manager, MSC construction project manager, the name of your supervisor, whoever that may be, then the participant has to confirm the following. I have been briefed about this research project and its purpose and agree to participate, yes, no. I have discussed any requirement for anonymity and confidentiality with the researcher, yes or no. I agree to be in audio tape, video tape during the interview, yes or no. Tip there is, don't turn up for an interview and say, oh, do you mind if I video record this or audio record it? I think as part of setting up the interview, you should be saying, would you be happy if? So you're not arriving with the kit and putting the person under pressure. The worst case scenario is the participant may say, whoa, I'm not doing this, goodbye. 
Uh, so give them some advance notice if that is something you would like to do. At least you are warning them to the scenario, giving them a chance to make a decision. They have the option to give you more information about any specific requirements they have for anonymity or confidentiality, and they then sign it. Um, sorry, you sign it to say that you've provided information about a research participant and believe that he or she understands what is involved. And I they sign it just here. So your participant signs there, and you sign it there to say that this is correct. So, a summary of what we've covered today. Um, look beyond the codes of practice to see ethics from the standpoint of all the people who have a vested interest in your project. Explain why an understanding of research ethics and one's own ethical petition is important. So you should be able to think now, I know why ethics is important to my study. Why I've got to think about it. Similarly, you should be able to talk through with yourself how ethical decisions are important in all stages of research project. It's not something you just do at the data collection point. You need to be thinking now about how you're going to implement ethical conduct in your research and explain the importance of personal and professional integrity and its practice in research. Now, one of the things that is in the handbook for the dissertation is data protection. You've acquired all of this data, interview transcripts, electronic surveys. You're going to have this pool of information after you hand in your dissertation. What do you do with it? You've got to dispose of it safely. So this is what I said before, research ethics at the beginning, in the duration, but beyond. When you get enrolled on the dissertation module and you get access to the module handbook, it will explain to you about the safe disposal of the data that you acquire while working on your dissertation, how long you should keep it, and at that point, how you should be disposing of it safely. So this again is an ethical practice issue. All right. Anybody got any questions? Well, what happened with your dissertation um, when you, after you hand it in, like what will the university? What would it do with it? Yeah. Yes. You hand in two bound copies of your dissertation. They are logged by one of the administrators as coming in. Then they are distributed to the two examiners. So your supervisor is one of the examiners and another member of academic staff is the other supervisor. And the other supervisor will not have been involved in supervising or have any influence on you or your research as part of producing the dissertation. They mark the work, right? When they've marked it, if they can't agree on a mark, then it goes back to me and it gets marked again by another member of staff. So that's potentially three people who so far have seen your work. Then, irrespective of whether you have the two or the three, it then goes to, it doesn't go to, the external examiners will come in and also assess the work. So that's five individuals, potentially, who could look at the work. After all of that process, the dissertations are safely destroyed but before that, we say to students, you can come in and collect the copies when you come in for your graduation. If you don't come in and collect them, we will destroy them. So electronic copies, as you saw, are put on Blackboard for students to see. So they're not put in the library where everyone and somebody can see the dissertations. I think up in the hub, I think real estate management, they have dissertations lying around I'm a little nervous about that. I think it's a good thing in some ways, but I think there's some downsides to that as well. So the only people who see project management, construction project management dissertations, or, or students like yourselves on the electronic version, the supervisors and the external examiners, doesn't get made available to the entire university. Is that okay? 
Um, just about the electronic version, um, if you disagree with that, is that possible? Or is it like Who's going to disagree about that, you or the participants? Well, maybe the participants. If the participants have a problem with that, then you need to be letting us know. But you have to sign as part of submitting your dissertation that you are happy to make it available to other students. And happy for me to send it on your behalf if it's good enough to various professional bodies for competitions. So if the participant is saying, I don't want this published, I think we have to be thinking more about the ethics, to be honest. Because if you have a company who's saying, I don't want this published, I think questions have to be raised about, does their name have to be mentioned at all in the dissertation? And we've already said, no, it doesn't. Um, they really shouldn't be divulging data that they are very worried about anyway, if that makes any sense. So I think that's an extreme situation where um, it's, it's got to be addressed through the ethical procedures, really. Um, I don't think we can entertain a scenario where everybody who submits a dissertation, the participants say, well, I don't want this for any mesh. If we're having that, then there's an ethical issue to start with. So I think we've got to have this discussion with the participants as part of that process. But we have had one example over the last, as I say, seven years, where it was so extremely sensitive that we did agree that it wouldn't be put on, it wouldn't be made available to anybody. I can't even tell you what it is because it was that sensitive in terms of the context of it being appropriate. Any other questions? Covered a lot this morning, guys. Switch this off.